All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Michelle Dezember, and I'm the Chief Program Officer here at the Aspen Art Museum, and it's a great honor to be hosting tonight's uh, Legacy Lecture, which is the second in the series we're doing. Um, we, we want to say thank you to the Question, Lecture Seri Question Education Fund for making this program free, as well as the Laffey McHugh um, Foundation. But most of all, we would like to say a very big thank you to the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, who is a wonderful partner of ours for many years now. And a special thank you to Christy Mann, Jim Kravitz, and I see also I want to say a big thank you also to Trevor, who's here from Toklot. Um, ACES is just such a wonderful partner, and we love them so much, and it's just been such a great pleasure to work with them over the years and to put this lecture on, um, which as a bit of a context in terms of why we're presenting this lecture as a legacy lecture, um, you'll see from the logo up here, ACES is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, and the Aspen Art Museum is also celebrating a year of anniversary, so 40 years since we were founded as an institution, uh, 15 years that we've been hosting Art Crush, and five years since we moved into this building. So we kind of have this joke running joke around the museum that 5 plus 15 equals 40. And if you're like me and you're in the arts and you're bad at math, you might realize those numbers don't add up. But we are saying that joke because we feel that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so really when we come together as a community, it creates something much bigger than any one institution or any one individual can do. So as a lead up to this kind of anniversary summer, we wanted to spend some time reflecting back on um, cultural figures that have made a big impact on the kind of arts and cultural scene, um, both at the local level, the state level, and the national level. So we've had the national level spoken to by Ingrid Schaffner. We're very excited to have Issa Cato and Kent Mace here to talk about Stuart Mace and the legacy that he left with talk lot. Um, and then next Tuesday will be a lecture by our found, one of our founders, Richard Carter, in conversation with Lissa Ballinger, talking about his time working with Herbert Beyer um, and how that was kind of foundational to not only his time in Aspen, but to founding the museum itself. Uh, and then we'll round it out with a lecture on May 7th by um, Adam Lerner, who's the director of the MCA Denver. Um, so I'm going to just begin by giving an introduction very briefly to the format for this evening and to our very lovely, wonderful speakers. Um, first, that's, that's these guys, yeah. I also, also have to say no one's ever brought flowers, so they're already my favorite speakers, I have to say. <laughs> so thank you to Isa who brought the flowers. Um, so we've brought these two together. Many of you, I have a feeling, already know this and the important connection that they both have to Toklat. And I'm hoping, can I actually just see a show of hands of who's been to Toklat in the room, if you've been before? That's fantastic. Um, I can also say from personal experience, I've been many times, Jim has helped us to coordinate retreats for the Aspen Art Museum there, and it's really, as you all know, a true gem of our community. So we wanted to reflect back not only on the um, conservation and beauty of the space, but also the role that the arts and art artisanal work have had there. So we've invited um, Stuart Mace, who is the founder of uh, Toklat and then an important part of ACES, his son Kent here. Um, Kent grew up at Toklat and now owns a Denver-based specialty woods business and continues to work artistically as he will share with us. And Issa Kato here on the left is an artist who has spent the last 25 years working in watercolor and mixed media. She's represented by Harvey Meadows Gallery and Christy Stubbs Gallery, and she is, I like this sentence, a quiet advocate for arts, social justice, and conservation. So the two of them will be in conversation for about 30 minutes or so and share some images with us and share some stories. And then we'll open it up for other memories, conversations, questions that you might have for the two of them for about a half hour after that. So please join me in giving me a warm welcome to our two speakers tonight, Kent and Issa. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah, hello. Okay, this, uh, this is not, you know, the micro thing, phone thing is not in my comfort zone. Um, well, it is so great. I mean, I did not expect this many people. And it's such a pleasure to be here with Kent and ACES and the Aspen Art Museum. So thanks for bringing us together. Um, I was one of many who learned about reverence for the natural world from the Mace family. And uh, I'm truly grateful. But I think we need to begin at the beginning, that proverbial question of, tell me about your childhood, because your stories are so wonderful. And it, it bears repeating and repeat. every time I hear more about the family and Toklat, I learn something new. And um, so let's begin at the beginning. Uh, the hospital used to be across the river over there. 
I remember that. <laughs> it, um, my, I, I, my, my sister Lynn is here, and she, she was, knows the beginnings of the uh, Mace family in the Valley. By the time I got in high school, she was gone, and then it became my time to, to uh, be part of the family. But my memories of, of my father and, and Aspen go back to the glory hole when it was in the middle of town when I could come down and ride the, ride the elevator in the hardware store up and down, right? The old rope, to, rope elevator in the hardware store. Tompkins? Don't remember, quite remember the name. But I was really sad. There was a fire truck in the window of that hardware store that I really needed in my, in my world and I never got. <laughs> um, our, our family was about about making people's time in Aspen the best it could be. Uh, we grew up uh, behind the scenes in feeding and taking people into the mountains and working every, vac every time it was time off for everybody to have a, a holiday. The Mace family was behind the scenes diligently trying to make that happen for everybody else. So I grew up in a world where it was the thing to do was to be of service. Um, my my father had leased the property, uh, had been given the basically begin, given the permission to be at Toklat in the late 40s. Never owned the land, and so our family mission at Toklat was one of service and introducing people into the high country around Toklat. Um, we came with dog teams. And we, I grew up knowing 100 to 150 dogs far better than I knew my kids at school. We uh, left out of school and went home and fed and uh, cleaned up and took care of the dogs at night. And during the night when we had loose dogs, we were up and out taking care of the dogs. So our world was taking care of dogs, taking people into the high country during the weekends, uh, on the sled dogs and having just a wonderful time of being in service to people and introducing them to nature. And at that point, it was, for us, it was just pulling off an experience. And it, from the backside, we were having a blast. But we learned to work. Um, things changed and we eventually had to move a restaurant into Aspen. Um, I remember my sister Lynn at the chart house. Um, <laughs> early on, much littler, and she was a, a waitress there for a little while. And across from the chart house, we had a couple, uh, a couple homes that we had crew in, and there was I, just weird memories here. Uh-oh, we're going to have to stop this. But there was a pair of parakeets across from the, from the chart house who used to whistle at the waitresses. Remember a car being driven through the front of, of uh, the Hickory House and being parked there in the bar. <laughs> but over the years, uh, we first took taxis. Uh, Stuart convinced the school district that we, they had to get us to school. So we took a uh, taxi to school. Uh, they would come up and get us and then take us back at night. And back when we had snow, like this year, uh, although this was a little excessive, we used to there used to be avalanches over the road uh, between us and Toklat. So we got a day or two off of school, and then they would finally figure out. They would take us down to one side of the avalanche. School bus or the taxi would pick us up on the other side of the avalanche, and we'd get school in. And one one, one of my best friends was Peter Worth. Uh, I think he's he's in Grand Junction now, but Peter used to ski down the back of Ajax. And we would pick him up in the taxi every morning, and he would get the ski from the top of Ajax all the way down. And then he left, he left uh, class at 3 o'clock every afternoon to catch the lift back up to the sun deck. What a life, huh? <laughs> so that would go on. We better cut that short. Uh, well, um, those are great anecdotes, but... I <laughs> 
<laughs> and I could listen to them for a long time. But what? Um, tell us more about the evolution of t Toklat and its relationship to Aces, because that was something. You so jump about. forward, uh, jump forward a, a long ways into there. Um, you know, the very beginnings of that, I was, I was uh, doing other things, but Stuart and Elizabeth Papke developed a relationship that was a, 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 an incredible love for each other, and they were of the wrong personalities. So Stuart, Stuart and Elizabeth got together. Elizabeth was gonna, wanted to do something with her property there in Hallam Lake, and the two of them got together. Don't, I don't know that part of the history well, but I do remember my dad coming home from uh, in the beginning of ACES and just shaking his head and just murmuring to himself about Elizabeth. They just didn't know how to get on with the first process. But it, through that, uh, Tom and Jody uh, Cardamone were hired as the first uh, caretakers of ACES. And Stuart felt so committed to sharing the balance of nature and his love for nature, his love for art. Um, and the, the start of ACES was strictly that, was to start an organization, didn't know where it was going to go, the land was, was, was given, and to strike out to, to talk about our place in Mother Nature and begin that conversation. That was a long time ago. My, my parents were into eating right um, eat and staying in balance with nature and food. Uh, we would drive to the restaurant. We'd drive up into, into Montana and get chickens for the restaurant. We went around and bought food that was the healthiest that he could find for the, re for the restaurants. And so as, as, as uh, ACES got going and Tom and Jody came in and start, they started the programs, he was 100% all in. And it became, became part of our family in those days. Uh, his first request at his passing that he wanted to make sure that we knew was that he wanted Toklat to go on to a public organization, and if it could possibly have been, it would have been ACES. And so through Tom and Jody and our family and the hardship of not owning a property that we had lived in forever, we had quite a hard time in our family as that transition happened, um, we found a wonderful donor who began the process. Well, those were my parents, so I can't yep. take credit. So, but, but I am gonna, I am gonna go. jump in here because people probably wonder why were we attached to this property? This and, is a good story. And so my parents used to drive up, um, they started driving up to Colorado from Texas, from San Antonio. And there, I couldn't find them, I, I'm afraid they're lost forever, but there were these crazy footage of going over Independence Pass, talk about the snow, you know, and they would summer in that old cabin by Pepke, it was the old Pace House uh, in the corner of Pepke Park. It's still there. It's a log cabin across from where that endless construction where Hotel Laneda used to be is. But anyway, um, they found Actually, the mace. What? Oh, there she is. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, wait. There was my mother. That was an old Burko photograph. Um, and she fell in love with the Mace family. And she would take all of us up. And we did the kumbaya thing. You know, there was a lot of, the, my mother was, she could play the banjo and the guitar. And we all had sing-alongs. And when I was a very little girl, younger, this must have been one of the last campfires we were at, because we were teenagers. Um, that's my brother, Willie. And I was out there one day for uh, some sort of family gathering. And I was just pulling up flowers from the meadow. And Stuart Mace said, stop, stop. Um, do not destroy indiscriminately. And 
I may have been seven years old, but that was one of those, just one sentence. And he said, we are all part of one being, one organism. So that flower is no better than you, and you are no better than that flower. And so that's the kind of legacy that Stuart left for us and each one of us. So my parents were so grateful, and they did not want to see uh, Toklat destroyed or uh, developed, uh, and that's where it was slated, right? Uh, you probably know that history better than I do. So that's why they stepped in. But this was a big fabric of our lives growing up, this real commitment to conservation and presence and reverence. I mean, the Mace family, everything they did was about reverence um, for the natural world. So that's, that's where it comes in. That's a great, great story. And I was, I was telling her last, we were talking about this, but I have some dear friends, the Hartmans, who became, uh, did a bunch of beautiful woodwork in Chicago, and he's now passed. But uh, his experience was the same thing. Joe and Sharon brought their children to Toklat uh, because they wanted, wanted them to get a feeling of, a, of what it was to have a different perspective than, down, than Chicago burbs. And uh, Joe was forever grateful, and they returned year, <clears throat> year after year bringing their kids to Toklat to share the children with the Mace family and the life at Toklat. And, and um, your father made my mother into a huge wildflower stalker. And so this is a false potato. And she passed that on to me. And, and he turned me on to bird watching. So uh, what did, you said that you, at this point we have to change the way we think one individual is a time, at a time. And I love that because he... Toklak Tok, Tok was about giving somebody some solace and some peace and some rest and some good food and changing one being at a time. And whether that was the adult or the child or the kid or someone coming for dinner, there was a, there was a sharing that happened at Toklat, there was one person at a time. And the door was always open, and we felt, the family felt like we were part of everybody who walked through that door. So we're headed that way again. I, I certainly hope so. And um, I know, I, Michelle, I, I'm not keeping track of time and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, your parents and other uh, Aspen icons understood was the symbiotic relationship between the arts and nature. And that the arts uh, are also vital to the health of the community. So I was wondering if you could talk about that philosophy a little bit, that they didn't distinguish between craft and fine art, that there was this intersection of design and celebration uh, and wonder um, that got woven into this process. This is a, uh a print from my dad's early, I believe, college years. And I had no idea that he could take a pencil and draw that well. And that didn't rub off on me, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, my dad was completely intrigued. No matter what mood they were in, he was intrigued with the beauty and the depth of Mother Nature and with people and individuals. People, he loved folks, he loved who they were on the inside, loved to talk to them, and loved to tell stories. But throughout his entire life, he, en he endeared in our family a love for Mother Nature, and a respect for Mother Nature, and an awe-inspiring, never, there's never ending, every day is a beautiful day uh, in creation. Uh, I was t told was telling a story today about uh, Michael Kinsley. I don't know, Michael, are you here? No. Anyway, he was saying that uh, Stuart would come in down to the to the county commissioners meeting, and he would just dread the day when he knew Stuart was going to show up. The door the door would fly open, <laughs> and Stuart would be defending the beavers. 
<laughs> on the road and how dare they go and take the grater over too far and t do in that nice pile of wildflowers. He was always standing up for something that was bigger than him. And he was bigger, th bigger than, you know, a big personality. But he took time in his day and felt it deep in his being that he had to defend Mother Nature from us human beings. And he loved, to, he loved to say, he said, you know, we are fouling our nest. And this was 40 years ago. We, 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 we were taught this and we started Malachite Farm School. It was early. He started ACES. But the, the idea that we have a place in nature and we're not dominant to nature was, in, was, was his message. Well, how are we going to bring that philosophy back in vogue? I mean, here we are in a time where money and celebrity are gods. And um, what, what do you think the answer is? I mean, it, uh oh, we, no. How, gonna, yeah, no. Oh. How, yeah, uh, yeah. So I have an answer. How to that. do we get back there? I have an answer to that. And it may be that I just turned 65 and I don't care what I say anymore, but. <laughs> Um, it's hugely important, and I believe the new mission for Toklat is the, is the conversation that we need to have between environment and, per, and spirituality. If we're to honor our planet and work on our planet in the masses we are now, we have to find ourselves spiritually in it. And so the answer is from the inside. And that's finding our peace with each other, finding our love with each other. And in nature, you can find that if you go sit by a tree long enough, it's there. And so I believe that, that ACES's mission, besides bringing children in and doing everything that's done, is to provide a quiet space of healing for people that can come to Toklat and feel that they are a part of nature and feel the majesty of the energy that flows in from the moment, not the past, not the future, but our spiritual beings. And the more we can begin that conversation as a humanity, uh, as a county, as a state, as a country, as a world, that's our mission here, to free ourselves from all the things that we think we have power over and realize that we're just part of this plan. I, I, and I just want to add that one thing that always impressed me about your father, at least the legend of your father, is that he thought this attachment to rank and pomp and circumstance was just a terrible form of vanity. Am I wrong? Most definitely, yeah. Um, and that we need to get rid of that right quick, as my father used to say. <laughs> Be done with it. Be done with it. <laughs> so, um, all right, you know, we are going to get off the heavy stuff. I do want to hear, because um, every single one of the MACE progeny are creatives. So I would love to hear about how your life folded into your creative process and your business and your path. So this picture, well, I don't have that picture. Let's see. Uh-oh, we're out of uh -oh. it. Uh-oh, here, here, here let, me, let me, you talk. I'll, uh-oh. So anyway, um, I, don't know what I'm doing. I still have some lumber in our woodshed down at the farm oh, that is uh, the tree that Stuart and Isabel were married under. And he went back and convinced them to take that white oak tree down and cut it into lumber. So I grew up moving lumber from storage barn to storage barn to storage barn. When he would wear out his welcome at somebody's barn and they needed it, we'd move the lumber to somebody else's barn. And his, uh, his knowledge of trees from being a botanist in, in Indiana was incredible. 
he could tell what a tree was without leaves from the bark, from the road, going 60 miles an hour. He would be, he could tell us what that tree was. He had a love for trees. And I, the love for lumber and for trees didn't come naturally. Once I got to Malachite Farm and I realized I was married and had to make a living, I had learned that in the shop at Toklat, Stuart had had me put tables together and do things that sold at the Toklat Gallery. When we moved from the chart house, there was a couple galleries in Aspen, and then when, when we finally moved up into, uh, or from the Hickory House to the chart house, which is now, now not the chart house, I don't know. Anyway, the, the first thing in that walking in to get dinner was to walk through the gallery. And it was, he called it with, with These Hands Gallery. But anyway, back to wood. I was just flashing back and traveling in the back of a, back of a, back of a scout with bedrolls freezing to death. And we were going from Hogan to Hogan on the Navajo Nation buying rugs and jewelry and visiting families. But let's go back to wood. So... Uh, with all this wood collection and my being married and having to, to, uh, to make a living, and Stuart had a gallery, and he was just waiting to tell somebody what to do to build things. And so I started building tables, which he would put together with, had a wonderful, his philosophy was if you don't, if you don't color the wood, any wood works with any wood, and let's just start putting wood together. And we built tables for years together. Uh, and then through the folks that came and went from the Toklat Gallery, who were building beautiful homes in Aspen, I got the privilege of starting to build beautiful front doors. And we m morphed into tables. Uh, after tables, we went into floors and ceilings. And uh, that got way too big and too crazy for Kent. So about 15 years ago, we decided a good friend of me of mine came in and said, uh, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "I love wood. Let's start a wood company." So Collector Specialty Woods got started later, about 15 years ago. And since that time, we stock woods from around the world. I buy trees and travel. I just bought a beautiful 1880s walnut. Uh, probably what 80 years after Lewis and Clark arrived in the uh, Portland area. Somebody arrived with a walnut seed, planted a tree, and we just took a beautiful tree down up there that will make absolutely gorgeous tabletops. But there's, there's a wonderful thing in art, and I always have had a hard time figuring out what is art and what's not art, so excuse the, that world for the moment. <laughs> but to envision a piece of beauty in your head, in the ethers, and begin the process of bringing that down and doing all the work it takes to bring it into paper or bring it into wood or bring it into something that can be in time here is the magic. And he taught me that magic of creation. You know from what you do. It just comes out and down and there's something that comes out of you that is, that is, is, is you, you can't call it anything more than God-given or nature-given, but a power much higher than ourselves comes through you and brings something be of beauty into the world. And currently, we have a 18-person crew. Uh, I've got four salesmen in Denver, and we're in the process of being, bringing beautiful wooden pieces into homes and businesses. Um, in Colorado and around the western part of, of the United States. Actually, we just got a project in Manhattan. Well, can I read the quote uh, that you're from the Bill Moyers interview? Because that wraps up um, uh, what uh, Stuart said. Um, I want to give my kids a place to build their mind, body, imagination, and artistic sense. You can't appreciate your fellow man until you appreciate nature. Without that, you can't feel any wholeness. And I couldn't agree more. So 
where would you like to see this valley? I mean, you spoke to this a little bit. How to get this valley back to this pilgrim soul that your father and your family started with? Um, is it through education? Is it, um, as you mentioned, individual by individual? Uh, can you speak to, again, back to the the you know there's some here there's some, out of out of uh, out of Aspen out of this area there's some heroes, and there's actually a lot of them. Um, and my side of those heroes is my dad, and Paul Solner, and Brad Reed, and the list goes on and on and on. And it is the art, the people that came to Aspen felt the magic of the Aspen area and created art, did pottery, did ironwork. Uh, uh, Francis Whitaker, who was a uh, I think even Francis made it to a county commissioner or something here for a little while. But Stuart carried those folks' stuff in the gallery, and because of the, the, of the Aspen clientele, was able to sell their beautiful stuff. So we sold wonderful ironwork, wonderful pottery. Uh, and so back to your answer to your question, I think we need to make some heroes in Aspen. I think ASIS is on its way here. Uh, one of their founders is now gone, and we don't have to tell complete truth, right? We can make up make up some stories, and and, and and but it's time that we have some age to our this community and rely upon some of that history and start using it. Uh, excellent uh, suggestion. I don't. I can't embellish on that at all. I can't. You, yeah, that's perfect. You know. I think education about those heroes, bringing people in. This is where Ashcroft. Where people really don't know what Toklat is. They ride their bicycles by it, and um, I think it's going to be an interesting challenge to teach people why this matters, why Toklat matters. That's always the question. Everybody is so insanely busy. And we're in a very, uh, a culture that is addicted to consumption. So that slowing down, I mean, Jim Kravitz and I, you know, uh, love going there and yakking and losing time because we're not connected on the phone. No one's, t you know, there's not the tyranny of busyness, right? So that translation is going to be, I guess, ACE's job and all of our jobs here, that what, what are the important things is uh, taking a breath, looking at some flowers, translating those flowers into a creative form, if you've got that sort of energy, honoring those who do. Um, but it's something that I worry about and, and think about a lot because I worry about this community and its connection to the environment. So um, on that note, are we almost finished? Can I leave you with another quote? It's really cool, I promise. I don't want to be one of those people who's always reading quotes, but I've been binge reading. Uh, have, has everybody heard of Ursula Le Guin? So uh, do you have anything else you want to add before I launch into my quote? that I love so much. We're okay. We're supposed to do this, do this in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, well, but my husband said, eh, too long, too long. So um, here we go. Uh, Ursula Le Guin has these incredible essays. She's not just a sci-fi writer, and she died last year. Uh, exceptional being and artist. I think the imagination is the single most useful tool mankind possesses. It beats the opposable thumb. I can imagine living without my thumbs, but not without my imagination. In the marketplace, the word creativity has come to mean the generation of ideas applicable to practical strategies to make larger profits. I don't use it anymore, yielding it to capitalists and academics to abuse as they like. But they can't have imagination. 
Imagination is not a means of making money. It has no place in the vocabulary of profit making. The imagination is a central tool of the mind, a fundamental way of thinking, an indispensable means of becoming and remaining human. Pretty cool. Yay. I, Yay. Have, I, I have one. Okay, you have one too. I, I oh, have, that's right. That I have one. one. Uh, this was written by a, a dear friend of Stuart's. Stuart loved this. And so I, I, we dug it out. And the lady was Nancy Wood. She's passed now. And I'm, I'm, I'm not good at reading it, but here we go. Um, it's called My Help is in the Mountain. My help is in the mountain where I take myself to heal the earthly wounds that people give me. If I find a rock with sun in it and a stream where the water runs gentle and the trees which one by one give me company, so must I stay for a long time until I have grown from the rock and the stream is running through me and I can't tell myself from one tall tree. Then I know that nothing touches me nor makes me run away. My help is in the mountain that I take away with me. Earth cure me, earth receive my woe, rock strengthen me, Rock, receive my weakness. Rain, wash away my sadness. Rain, receive my doubt. Sun, make sweet my song. Sun, receive the anger from my heart. Bravo. I've never heard that before. I read that. That was one of Stuart's favorite. And if, if you want something really fun tonight, go YouTube. Uh, and uh, let's us uh, now go listen to the creation of Sam McGee. It's a Robert Service, yeah, Robert Service, the creation of Sam McGee. Stuart used to love to read that after about two or three of his hot tea and rums, and he had everybody warmed up. He would read the creation of Sam McGee. All right, are we on the uh, Q&A? Yay. All right. Oh, what am I doing wrong? I've got the mic that has questions. Thank you so much. This was wonderful, kind of a love fest. <laughs> um, are the same programs continuing at Toklat now? I'm sorry to say I haven't been up there in a while. That's an ACES question. A lot, of, a lot of the same programs still exist. There's artist in residence programs. There's Aspen Institute groups going up there. There's nature walks, snowshoe walks, field school classes. And in the summer, you can still walk through. And we invite everybody to come through this summer. It's going to be, it's going to be beautiful. The doors will be open. I think uh, middle of June, June 15th. Just to, to, to add to Jim, is, uh, it's 50 years, and ACES is having a celebration. And we're trying to raise a whole bunch of money to rebuild Toklat, fix the plumbing, fix the electrical. The roofs are all leaking. And so we're going through a fundraising operation here with ACES and trying to raise, I think, Jim, we're trying to raise $5 million currently just for the Toklat, and there's another pile of money on that to keep ACES' roofs, down to, down, roofs and uh, the farm going. So ACES, is, we're going through a transition here where we have drawings for a new building, and we have plans, and I believe we're, I was told today, we're actually somewhere in the getting the approvals from the county and going, having meetings with the neighbors up there. So ACES is in a transition of putting a whole bunch of energy back into Toklat and breathing a new life into, into that building and with program and with community. Uh, I do want to add that one of the uh, missions of ACES is to 
bring kids up, education from Down Valley up to us, that this is not just going to be for wealthy white people. <laughs> this is going to be uh, an education center for all. And uh, Jim's laughing at me. I, I see it. You, you want to embellish? Um, but I, I have to be blunt, because I, it's important that nature is not seen as, or, or appreciated for the natural world as, as a luxury. It, it's critical. So, um, and we need, and, and so Tokelot's going to be part of that mission, or have a, be a, uh, an eco-missionary, as it were. So, that's another uh, component I really, uh, Daniel and I feel very strongly about this. Um, so, who built the original building? Uh, a lot of folks. Uh, my mom and dad started uh, with the, with uh, you know Lynn might be able to answer that better than I can. The original folks, but the. What happened to that building was is the the, uh, the number one ski lift was to go right in front of that that the original ski lift for Aspen was to be right there, and uh, so Stuart put the put a put a put a house right there. Then the number one ski lift moved downtown, down here, and they uh, put that building in. And then as they had kids, they added rooms. And so the roof goes up, and the roof goes down, and the roof goes over here, and the roof goes that way. Um, and so there, it's a, uh, added on to th three or four times. Thank you to you both. Um, my question would be probably um, for Kent. Uh, what was Stuart Mace's art process like? You mentioned that you found a drawing of his and you didn't really know he was such a good drawer. When you were growing up, was he more of a woodworker? Or, and did he draw at all? And what what was his process like as an artist? Stuart, uh, st 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 he, he lived his artwork through other people. He, if you did something beautiful with your hands, and he thought that he could pass that on and somebody else would appreciate it, he would put your piece in the gallery and he would talk that thing up until somebody loved it. <laughs> and he lived vicariously through, including me, uh, and I still, that's still what powers me. Uh, I, I still get powered by that knowing that, that he's living vicariously through my, my, my art and uh, you know, if Eddie was here, he he would uh, he would tell you that Eddie, Eddie uh, he grew artists up. He was hard on them. He was hard on us. He would critique us, and he would make sure we understood what was going to sell and what wasn't going to sell, and what was half-hearted and what was fully-hearted. Did I answer your question? Did I answer it all right? Uh, no, the building was was uh, leased to my parents from Ted Ryan, and Ashcroft was a, se uh, was a separate thing. There's 2.7 and some acres that eventually ended up being the Toklat property. Kent, can you talk about your father's use of the word steward or stewardship of the valley and how that applied to nature? Yeah, I thought he invented it. <laughs> <laughs> it was his way of saying we have a place in the plan. And we have to carefully and quietly discover our place in the plan. And then it is our our job to carry that plant to carry that out, and stewardship is caring f for our place in Mother Nature. Uh, we started Malachi Small Farm School, which lasted some 20 years and then failed because of its location. But uh, we 
our mission down there was to bring adults and kids in and show them their place in gardening and cooking and woodworking and farming and harvesting. Now, we are supposed to be stewards of this planet. We're not supposed to be here ruling over it and ruining it. So I'd actually like to ask a kind of closing question to both Kent and Issa, which kind of came up for me as I was listening to you both speak. Um, and I was thinking of uh, a friend and an, um, an ACES alum to Aaron Truk, who we just lost this year, who um, taught me a lot about bravery and caring, which are two elements that I see in common between conservation for nature and the artistic pra practice or process. So I'd like to ask you to, in kind of a closing reflection um, and really thinking about all of these years of uh, legacy left by Stuart Mace, um, either on you individually, personally, or what you can see on a larger community level of what a kind of brave act of caring could look like from either of your perspectives. It's a big question, but it's a big <laughs> question. Do you have the answer right away so I can think? <laughs> Come on, rescue me so I can process this. A brave act is, of caring for me is to take a big, beautiful tree that was planted in the 1880s that is a specimen and knowing that if I go look inside that tree and cut that beautiful thing down and hear it cry, that out the insides of that tree, that tree will be beauty in many, many people's lives. And to add to that, which is pretty cool, I felt so badly in taking that tree down that I gathered up the walnuts from around that tree and put them on the hood of my rent -a car <laughs> <laughs> right? And I was so enthralled in the cranes and all the action, and the, we, we were filming it for a reality TV show. And it was, I was a mess. But anyway, I drove off with all those walnuts on my hood of my car. And about the second turn down the road, I realized the last walnut falling off the, the hood. So I decided that I should stop right there. And I turned right back around. And I went and picked up a whole other bunch of walnuts. And today in C.S. Woods in Denver, I have 10 walnut trees planted from that big, beautiful walnut. And so my answer to your question. you got to go look inside. <laughs> my um, slightly different take. This is more of a performance uh, than a uh, direct creative process. But I think a brave act would be to make sure to see people and to listen to people and to slow down in this community and to really get to know uh, and this is a real brave act for me because I'm an introvert, but to make a real effort to get to know all the spokes in this community. I find that this community has gotten sort of constricted, and um, that's why I'm very excited about Tokla, because I see this as an opportunity, as a common ground and a gift for all of us. But so my, uh, so it's slowing down and looking at people and greeting them and listening. But that's, I don't know if that goes in the performance art, but a little detour from your original question. And that's it. I, does anybody else have any other suggestions? I want to hear about other acts of bravery. What's up with Bruce and Brian? Uh, Bruce is, uh, um, works for me, my, most of my family works for me, or works with me. And so Bruce is uh, in charge of keeping the C.S. Woods and the Malachite farm together. And he repairs and cleans on a daily basis down there. Um, he's hobbling around, he's had some health problems. But he's a ha happy camper when his body's working right. And Brian, Brian's in Hawaii. And he's a builder. Uh, um, and uh, right now he is trying to uh, move, you know, Hawaiian style housing. You just put up a roof and it works. He's trying to move from the roof and it works to a real house with two little girls and his wife and his 
is working his butt off and having a great time at life. His mom just was over there. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, actually, um, oh, thank you. I, when I was over there, I saw two of the homes he built. And they're spectacular. They were, um, they're just amazing. And one of them was a, is a um, guest house home. And he also, I think, um, got inspired by wood because he makes the most amazing pieces of wood in this house as he builds. And he uses all sorts of rare wood. And so he's got the talent and the inspiration from Stuart. And they, and they, yeah, Hawaii has a lot of uh, uh, very interesting, and I always bring a little sample home. <laughs> when we were hike, hiking up to this waterfall, and I found a little piece of wood, and I brought it back and um, put oil on it, and it's, it reminds me of being in with the kids, hiking up into the waterfalls and stuff. So he's doing great, and actually... I think he's just about to get his house started. That's the latest news. <laughs> so we're excited for them. Yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> thank you. Well, maybe to close out, I'll go back to saying thank you for sharing what I see as a brave act of caring, which is to be present. Um, these two have put a lot of thought and reflection into preparing for today, and it was really clear through your conversation and how present you were for us um, and helping us both be present by paying tribute to the past and respecting the future. So thank you both for your time, for your energy, for your memories, and thank you all for being here today. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you.